please open to the book of Isaiah tonight, Isaiah chapter 1 tonight. If you have your Bibles, thank you for being here, joining us live or online as well. Thank you for that. As we begin to look at this powerful, this powerful book, the book of Isaiah, uh, it is an Old Testament prophet, and it is packed full of theology about God, thoughts of God, truth about God, the character of God. It is in Isaiah that we find those three words, holy, holy, holy. And I am so thankful for what we find out about God in the book of Isaiah. I would submit that one of the major, if not the major theme of Isaiah is salvation from Jehovah or salvation from God. Now, if that is the theme, and I would submit that it is, and we'll look at some of that tonight, the question what must be asked, why would God bring that theme to his nation, his people of Israel, about them needing salvation? And the answer is an obvious one, one that we'll spend some time in the night, but the short answer is the reason that the theme of Isaiah is salvation is from Jehovah is because the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, God's people, were in a big, fat ugly mess they had made a royal catastrophe of their life their families their nation and every bit of God's law they had messed up they messed up not on a small scale but on a national scale they had consistently during these time of the kings, and Isaiah served through four kings. We find that in verse number one, and we find in other passages of Scripture as well. We find, if you were to follow these kings, that each one of them were dealing with some major sin and issues in the nation of Israel. And God in His grace, God in His wisdom, brings us Himself as salvation. It is in Isaiah that we find some of these these powerful verses, one of my favorites, Isaiah 7, 14, the promise of the virgin birth. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. I love that verse. It is foundational for Jesus Christ. But I love the fact that God says this, I myself, the Lord himself, will give you a sign. You see, times in our life, we pray for signs. And we pray that, you know, God, show yourself this way or, or just remind me how good you are. And I don't have a problem with that. And God often encourages us in some of those things. But then there are those times, Isaiah 7, 14 being one of them, where God says, listen, I am going to do something supernatural. I myself will give you a sign, one that you can't fabricate, one that you can't imagine, one you can't make up. I'm going to have a young virgin conceive and bear a child. And that child will be the Son of God. We find also in Isaiah the verses we used throughout the Christmas time for our Christmas puzzle. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah is a book about salvation from Jehovah. It's in Isaiah that we find that sweet, contemplative, challenging portion of Scripture, Isaiah chapter 53, where we find out about our Savior who was meek, who was wounded for our transgressions, who was not handsome to look upon, but was comely and common. Yet Isaiah 53, these familiar verses, but he was wounded for our transgressions. I like how at that point Isaiah turns that right back to him. He doesn't shout out from the top of the synagogue of the mountains, listen, God was wounded for you and for all of your mistakes, so that was absolutely true. But he acknowledges in a real sense what happened with our Savior happened for all of us. Because there's not a single one of us here who will be perfect. And he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, and by his stripes, we are healed. 
Friend, just take a moment and just let Isaiah 53 just sink in for a moment. The only reason that we have any goodness in life, blessing, eternal life, because Jesus Christ endured the stripes, the suffering, the affliction. And every whip of the cat of nine tails, every drop of blood that was shed was not just shed because you sinned or someone sinned who will live after us or before us, but because I sinned, because you sinned, because everybody sinned. Because the Bible says, and he is a propitiation, not just for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the salvation that Isaiah will clearly testify in the first few words to the end of the book. But tonight in chapter 1, I'd like us to consider the state of affairs that the nation of Israel had come into, actually more specifically the nation of Judah. And see if perhaps while we're looking at the terrible state of affairs that we find the nation of Judah, if maybe, just maybe, we could also turn that lens toward you and I. Because as I look at Isaiah chapter 1, it sure would be convenient if I could just point at someone else. That'd be nice, wouldn't it be? If you read the Bible and find some passage of personal conviction and say, you know what, this is good, but I'm sure glad that Brad Williamson's here because he really needs this. You know, make sure he listens to that because, you know, man, and just, just come forward now, Brad, because you need Jesus. No. It's often easy to point out in others their flaws and in others clearly see where God needs to work, but it's not always so easy in my life when I look at me. Because I can easily deceive myself, and the scripture tells me that I deceive myself in those times. And so tonight, for a few moments, I want us to unpack Isaiah chapter 1, just a few verses from Isaiah chapter 1, and see if perhaps what the flaws of the nation of Judah were at this time were maybe, just maybe, some common flaws. And maybe, just maybe, Scripture is accurate when it says, There have no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. And maybe, just maybe, the same things that plagued this nation of Israel, God's chosen people, thousands of years ago, are still the same things that catch you and I up. You would think that by now we'd have learned... Do you think by now with God's grace and his mercy that we'd have uh, the, the discernment to move beyond this? But I'm afraid, if we're honest, that see, these same things can affect us and infect us. I'd like us, before we pray, to look at uh, three verses, kind of the solution to this whole problem. It's found about halfway through the chapter in verses 18, 19, and 20, where the scripture reads, Come now... And let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword... For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Tonight, as we look at this message, we'll come to this passage for a closing point. Where God's plea will be simple, yet decisive. Where our response will be A or B. There is no C in God's economy. We often want to say, well, there is God's way... And then there's this horrible, wicked, pagan, devil way. And then there's one more place kind of in between the two. I'm not going to be way over here because, my goodness, that's really bad. That's like Brad territory. Sorry, I still love you, buddy. And I don't know if I can be all in over here because, boy, that's a lot of pressure in my life. And, boy, that just... That takes a lot of commitment, and I'd have to get rid of some things, and I'd have to make some, uh, some choices. I'd have to do some things different, and I don't know if I can do that. And, I mean, that's for the pastor and, and for the staff and, and for my kids, but uh, I can't be here. And I won't be over here for sure. So I'll just be somewhere right here. 
I won't be all the way over here, and I won't be over here, but I'll be right here. My friends, that lie could not be further from the truth. Because the choice will be simple tonight. Either here or here. And if you're not here, then you're over here. This can look all different ways. We'll talk about that a little bit in, in a few moments. The choice will be simple. Lord, as we approach your word, I ask for your help. I ask for your grace and your strength as I speak tonight. But Lord, I ask most of all for your spirit to move among us tonight. And Lord, I pray that this time as we look at this first chapter of Isaiah, that you would convict us and help us. And that you would, after we leave tonight, be more in the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's an area in our life, in our thoughts, in our spirit that does not please you, Lord, may we simply make the choice to follow you tonight. Lord, we ask these things in your name and give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's tonight, if we can, look at three ways that Isaiah will point out the children of Israel have completely and utterly and totally turned from God. What will be interesting as we look at these ways is some will appear rather obvious, and I believe some not so obvious. And that's the devious part of our life, is it not? That times we know exactly what is wrong, and other times we're like, oh boy, I messed up. There are times going into a camp, a summer camp or school camp, that, that God will begin to work, and you'll hear testimonies from the teenagers, and it'll go something like this. You know what? Before I came to camp, I knew what God was going to deal with. And that's often true in all of our lives. That often we know what God is dealing with. We may not have, have been submissive yet. So we'd be resistant, but we often know. But there are those times where it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize that. Yet God, His grace, forgives both. God forgives both. So tonight, I'd like to point out from Scripture how the, the nation of Judah, God's people, children of Israel, had walked away from God. Look, please, we'll begin in verse number 1. We'll read 1, 2, and 3 tonight. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So you see now, now God is saying, listen, these people that I have nourished, that I have cherished, that I have done so much for, they rebelled against me. That's the context I would submit for the entire book of Isaiah. I have done so much, God says. I have been so much. I am so much. And you have rebelled against me. And so now we're going to discover what has God seen and not liked. Look in verse number three, please. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. I want to point out, verse 3 tells us, and we have some other thoughts in this passage, that God's people, first of all, have ceased from recognizing God himself. God's people have ceased from recognizing who God is. Now, this seems unbelievable that they would not recognize who God is until I begin to consider my own life. And it appears, as you study the, the nation of, of Judah and Israel and all that had gone on, that they, they begin in their country, in their worship, in their nation, in their lives, begin to do all of these things and reap all of these things and not give credibility and credence to God. Or in essence, they forget to recognize who God is. And they see all of the blessings, and they think in their minds, I did this. Like this crop that I'm getting is because I put a lot of hours in, and I worked really hard, and I labored diligently, and man, I did a really good job forgetting who God is. 
Forgetting that God created everything, the heaven and the earth, all that we see, all that we don't see, that was God. Forgetting that God controls the environment and the weather, the rain, which he causes to fall on the just and the unjust. That's in his hands. Forgetting the fact that God sustains creation and that without God's sustenance in creation, there would be no seed time and harvest. There'd be no seasons. That every bit of this, the strength, the breath that we have is God himself. No, but they ceased from recognizing who God is. And God says here in verse number three, the ox, the ass, these animals, they know who their master is. Yet my people don't know who I am. They have forgotten to recognize me. They don't understand who I am. Even though I have given them my word and my law and my prophets, I have, I have labored over them. I have dumped blessings on them. And I wish that it were different in 2024, but it's not. Even though we have the Word of God, which we can access all day, every day, you and I can still be guilty of forgetting to recognize who God is and how He works in our lives. We forget that we are breathing, we are physically breathing only because of God. That our hands only move because God is allowing them to move. And if we do wake up tomorrow and go to work, it's God. If we have a profitable and successful day, it's God. That if our bills are met, it's God. That if we're not involved in some catastrophe, it's God. We forget that in trials, it's still God. That when life doesn't look that good, it's still Jehovah, the Almighty God. He's still in control. And I wish we could look at the children of Judah and be like, oh my, that's a terrible problem. Boy, I wish I wouldn't have that problem. But the fact is we must turn the light inward and realize that we often fail to recognize God himself. Animals don't forget that. That's what God says. But we forget it. I read a story about a farmer who had a sheep stolen. He took the man who stole, who claimed stole his sheep to court. In the midst of the judgment, the farmer who was claiming that his sheep had been stolen was trying to explain how this was his sheep and, and this other man, this cattle thief had taken it and the judge was having a problem discerning who was right and who was Lying because the other man was also saying, no, this is my sheep, and this farmer is trying to now in the court of law steal my sheep from me. So the judge had a stroke of genius. He put the sheep outside. And he had both men call the sheep. The sheep quickly ran to his rightful farmer owner. You see, Jesus said, my sheep... They hear my voice. They know me. I wonder if maybe in your life you've ceased from recognizing who God is. Oh, I'm not saying you don't know who God is. I'm not saying that you've forgotten your knowledge of, of God from the Bible, but maybe in your life and your spirit, you've forgotten who God is. What I find significant is that in the book of Isaiah, we find the name of God over 400 times. You know that's amazing? Because God's saying, listen, I'm going to remind you who I am. I'm Jehovah. I am the self-existing one. I am the one who has done all for you. I'm the one that delivered you from the, children, uh, from the land of Egypt back there. I'm the one who fed you with milk and honey and with manna and all these things. I'm Jehovah. Don't forget who I am. And my friends, tonight, if you've forgotten who he is, if maybe in your life because trouble has come and you look around and all you see is trouble, you forget who God is. Remember, he's still God. Remember, he's still in control. He's still the self-existing one. Even when you can't see it as clearly as you used to. See, the children of Israel had forgotten who God was. Not only that, they continued it down their downward trajectory. And in verse, beginning verse number four, we read this. Ah, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, 
a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. The next few verses, we find all about the sin that has infiltrated the children of Israel. You see, the rebellion that has happened in this passage of Scripture is not a rebellion against an irrational dictator. It's not a rebellion of some oppressed people trying to gain their freedom. It's not a war of independence in that sense. It is a war. It's a war against the Almighty. And here Isaiah says, listen, what has happened to the visuals, they've become sinful people. He uses some very descriptive words. He says they have become laden with iniquity. They are overloaded. They are overwhelmed. They are burdened down with sin. Not only have they become burdened with sin, they spawn sin. They're the seed of evildoers and they're children that are corruptors. So they influence others to sin. They're the epicenter of wickedness. This nation, these people had become sinful and every bit of them had become sinful. And yet it'd be easy to point the finger at children of Israel, wouldn't it? And say, my, wow. <laughs> they were really bad, weren't they? Whew. Boy, hmm. Those Israelites, those bad people. Now, thankfully, I and my piety and righteousness can rise above that. Yet if we're going to turn the light inward, can we not say that sin affects God's people today? Can we say that? Can we acknowledge that? Sure, we can acknowledge it in others. We can point the finger. Brad, once again, <laughs> boy, that guy's a bad guy. So easy. The thing about the person next to us, the person across the aisle, the person across the street, the coworker, the person who's an official, you read it on the news and social media, and you're like, my, 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 what is this world coming to? There is just sin everywhere. What will we do? And here at this point in Isaiah, Isaiah is not lambasting the other nations. He'll get to them. He will get to them in the book of Isaiah. But right now he's saying, listen, God's people are laden, burdened, overwhelmed with sin. And it's this sin that has provoked God. Christianity in 2024 is sin rampant or eradicated? What is sin like in your life? We can talk about churches for just a moment, but in churches, evil is called good and good is called evil. In churches. Love is destroyed, truth is destroyed. Lifestyles that have no part of God's design love is you do what you want to do as long as you put on a good show on the outside who cares you can live together that's not God's plan it's not God's plan you do whatever you want to do and, and sin is called good churches argue for alcohol consumption and God's clearly against it Evil's called good. We see the wicked sins, don't we? You see the track marks up there, and you say, boy, that person, some, some illicit drugs, we can see that. And we judge that. We can see that perhaps a young lady is selling herself as a prostitute. We say, my goodness, a shame. But what about the sins that are wrapped up a little more nice? How about the sin of when we replace my faith with logic. Because living without faith is sin, is it not? 
Because the Bible says, my Bible says at least, for whatsoever is not of faith is a sin. So I replace my faith with logic. How about that sin? Or instead of figuring out, you just walk by faith, not by sight. How about when I hold on to my bitterness and unforgiveness? How about that sin? And quit justifying it. In my mind, I excuse my anger because, you know what? This is what they did, and they were wrong. And you're right, they were wrong. They were wrong. How about that sin of holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness? How about the sin of exalting myself before God? This is one that Christians fall prey to all of the time. We wrap up what we want to do with a little spiritual verbiage, right? And thereby say, listen, it's me. But we claim it's God. You see, the children of Israel become filled with sin. What's important to note, though, is in this verse, end of verse 4, it says they have provoked the Holy One of Israel. Not only will you find the name of God used over 400 times in the book of Isaiah, you're going to find this little thought, the Holy One of Israel, in purity, over 31 times. Because God's holiness and purity are of the utmost importance to Christians and God's people. Not only had they ceased from recognizing God, had they become corrupted with sin, but then God's people did this. They began to display superficial worship. And God was sick of it. Verses 11 through 13, we find this. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. I said, listen, I am fed up with your superficial display of worship. Or you mask all of these other problems with a smile sitting in church, saying, look at that, I'm on God's side. It's like God is saying, like he said in Matthew, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Worship is a, in a church world is a fairly controversial word. Everyone interprets it a little bit differently. For some, worship uh, would be no instruments, and that would be worship. For others, worship would be no lights out there and plenty of lights up here. At the end of the day, there must be authentic worship. And it was not because they didn't know better. It was because everything else was off kilter. And so their worship couldn't be authentic. Their worship couldn't be genuine because their life and their heart and their actions and their desires were far from God. And so they couldn't have authentic worship. All they had was superficial worship. Now, in this chapter, understand that as Isaiah brings this charge from God, the children of Israel. He is not bringing a charge of one who has just made a mistake. Throughout Scripture, we find God's people falling and rising up again. In fact, God gives us this truth, right? A just man falls seven times, yet rises up again. And so tonight, the idea is not to kick you in the teeth but to remind us that, listen, we can be burdened with sin, laid and overwhelmed with sin. We can forget who God is. We can be guilty of false worship. So what's the answer that brings us to this passage I read, verses 18 through 20? Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. I want to stop right there because this is a powerful and this is such a promise that you and I have received. 
Because when the Bible says, and God says, come now and let us reason, this is not a discussion. God is not asking you to defend yourself. God is not asking you to, to stand up and say, now let's reason, all right? You talk, then I talk, then you talk, and I talk. No, no, no. God is giving us this thought. This word reason has the idea of a legal concept. And this word reason has the, the idea that when God reasons that though guilty, God will pardon the aforementioned sin iniquity. And that is the only answer you and I have, that when we come back to God, he can pardon. It is not that I must then do these things to receive pardon. No, I come back to God, and God in his grace, by the blood of Jesus Christ, all right, if we confess our sins, he is gracious and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the only answer. The answer is not, well, listen, you know what? My resolution is I'll recognize God every day of the week. The answer is not, listen, my resolution is I will not sin tomorrow or tonight or next week. No, my resolution must be I will come back to God and he must forgive my sin. And then God says this. Look, please. He says uh, in verse, I think it's verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. You see here in verses 19 and 20, God gives a simple choice. A, B. Choice A, come and let us reason. Have your iniquities pardoned by my grace, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's the, the promise of the washing of the blood in our life. All right, we are deemed and called, therefore, to be righteous. It's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God says, listen, choice A is I will do this if you are willing and, what does it say? Look at it. Verse, is it verse 19? Two words, willing and, willing and what? Obedient. Now, it's interesting that he would link these, these, two, these two words together, right? You ever been willing for something but not obedient? Come on now. Go back to, like I mentioned, resolutions been desiring something, perhaps, listen, this is the year that I'm going to be in the best shape of my life. That is my desire. And you're willing, but you're not obedient. Right? And we all know that in a physical sense, someone who is willing and not obedient will not have success. I really, really want to pass the history test. Did you study? No, I play video games all night. Well, you were willing... But you weren't obedient. And willingness without obedience will not bring about, in a physical sense, any results. And it's also true spiritually. God says it's not enough just to think, oh man, I hope this works out for me. Yeah, God, that's what I want. No, it requires me to take that step back towards God. To confess to forsake. In fact, if you look at the verses previously, it'll say things about listening to the instruction of God and doing good to people. Basically, what it's going to talk about is, listen, that your actions will demonstrate your desire. Did you get that? Your actions will demonstrate your desire. Now, remember, they had a false worship. This is from the desire of a heart that's right toward God. It says, God, I'm coming back to you. I want to reason with you. I need your forgiveness and my actions. I'm putting myself right under you. And whatever you want of me, I'm obedient. If you want me to confess my sin, I'll confess it. If you want me to go forward in invitation time, I'll do that. Whatever it may be. God will often touch the area that needs submission. At least he does in my life. Maybe not in your life. And he asks us to just submit humbly to him. Willing and obedient. It says in verse 20, but if ye refuse and, look at it, verse 20, rebel. rebel. So on this side, we have willing and obedient, A, or B, refuse and rebel. And that refusal can look a lot of different ways. It can look like delay. You know what? What God says is true, and it moves me, and I need to deal with that, and I will deal with that. I will. 
I'll just do it tomorrow. If we refuse, then rebel. In this passage, God says this, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. The nation of Israel had very specific promises that if they followed God, he'd bless their land and everything they did. And if they didn't, he would devour the land. They could see, they could look outside the window and find out if they were following God or not. Literally and physically. <laughs> and yet, God still, in our life, rewards those who follow him. And he chastises those who don't. Right, this is the truth through, throughout Scripture. This is not a health and wealth gospel where if you follow God, boy, you'll be a millionaire, a billionaire. No, but this is a reality of life. As you follow God in his ways, you'll find blessing and help and supernatural goodness. And when you resist God, he will resist you. All right, so you're going to fight against the God or you will reap his good gifts and perfect gifts. And, and so the choice is still the same. A or B. Just one thought and we'll be done tonight. You look at this and can I say it this way? Not to be too sacrilegious, but it's a no-brainer. Is it not? Like, hmm, which one should I choose? Oh, I'm really working through this. This is hard. Do I want God's blessing and his goodness and eat the good of the land? Or do I want God's sword to devour the land? Like supernaturally hurt the land or supernaturally help my life? Which one? Boy, I just can't decide. Can I, can I phone a friend? Can I pull the audience? Right? This would seem like a no-brainer. Like, duh, of course. Yet, which one do you think the children of Israel did? Over and over and over again. And to remind us of a point I made earlier, wouldn't it be nice just to point at them in our piety and say, oh my goodness, those silly children of Israel, my, my, how they continually followed their own impulses. Boy, that is so shameful. I'm so glad that I don't do that. And if we're honest, we're guilty of the same thing. The choice is just as plain, and the choice is still a no-brainer to shed your sin, to shed your own view of life and accept who God is, to shed your own worship and have authentic worship from a desire to please God and let him pardon your iniquities and willingly follow and obediently follow. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. That we find ourselves over and over and over again right back here am I the only one in here you with me so far I wish I could say that I never end up over here I really would like to say that but if I said that I'd be lying you'd know that and I bet you wish you could say you never end up over here where you never have an attitude that displeases God. You never have a thought that displeases God. You never have unforgiveness in your heart that displeases God. You never walk by logic, not by faith. You never have bitterness in your heart. You never have sin in your life. No, no, no. But the reality is we become burdened with sin. If we fail to recognize God, and our worship is superficial. So tonight, the choice is simple. Come back to God. And God says, just... Come back and I'll pardon you. Willingly follow me, obediently follow me, and you will reap and eat the good of land. So tonight, for us, come back. Come back. You may not be as far as a person next to you. Because that's what we do. We compare. And like, listen, that guy, Brad, he's way over there. But I'm not that far. The reality is we are all a lot closer to each other than any of us are to Jesus Christ. So tonight, quit comparing this way. Compare this way. And if God touches you right here, willingly and obediently, come back to him. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So tonight, what choice will you make?